Welcome to Reporting the World. I'm John Dancy, Director of International Media Studies at Brigham Young University. The American presidential elections have been called a gauntlet and an ordeal by fire. Certainly no country in the world puts candidates for the highest office in the land through the trial that we make them endure. They must raise millions of dollars, subject their private lives to examination, placate dozens of pressure groups, and do it all in the glare of minute-by-minute -minute press scrutiny. It is that last part, the role of the press, that we examine today. Joining us today are former Republican presidential candidate Bob Dole. Before challenging President Bill Clinton in 1996, Senator Dole was majority leader of the Senate and chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. He was also Gerald Ford's running mate in 1976. Mike McCurry has been White House Press Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs. He's had long experience in politics and served as campaign press secretary for Senator John Glenn in 1984. Gwen Eiffel is moderator and managing editor of the PBS program Washington Week in Review and correspondent for the Jim Lehrer News Hour. She has been national political correspondent and congressional correspondent for NBC News and covered the Clinton campaign in 1992 for the New York Times. John Decker is assistant professor of broadcast journalism at Howard University in Washington, D.C. He also serves as a reporter for ABC Television's Business Now program and correspondent for the USA Radio Network. He's also a special correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor and a regular contributor to a number of magazines and newspapers. Our program today is being taped before a live audience of students at Howard University in Washington, D.C. and is coming to you from the studios of WHUT Television on the campus of Howard University. Senator and then everybody else on the panel, I'd like to start with the same question to all of you. What's the role of the press in a campaign? Well, sometimes you never know what the role of the press is, but <laughs> my view was that they go out and, and determine what, you know, whether candidates are talking about issues, whether they're leveling, leveling with the American people. And uh, it's a very difficult job. I sympathize with the press at times, trying to condense it all, trying to get it on television or in a news story. But it should be, you know, it should be coverage, coverage of the campaign and not so much of the other stuff that happens from time to time. Right. You know, I think it was Edward Willis Scripps, the great newspaper publisher, and once said that the role of the press is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and uh, I think that's how the press approaches presidential campaigns. It's sort of the great equalizer. They take the front runners and put them under scrutiny and try to even up the odds sometimes to even, in effect, create a more interesting, more dynamic race. Uh, they also try to equalize the, the coverage of the horse race and substance, although I think they sometimes cheat a little bit on... The, the substance, but they are the filter through which the American people learn about the candidates and learn about the issues and see the debate back and forth, and they're obviously indispensable, but uh, I think their, their role is a very conflicted one. Do you agree with that, Greg? Well, I agree that it's a conflicted role. Um, I think that ideally our roles, we are to be truth tellers. We're to be the ones who take what is told to us and not only present it as told, but also explain what it means and ideally uh, sort that out for the American public. Mm -hmm. There are so many ways that people can get information now about campaigns. They can get information over C-SPAN unedited or over the internet unedited. And the only place, however, where they can still go and find regular information that is, that is compressed perhaps a little too much a lot of the time that says this is what's important today is, is still the old-fashioned nightly news broadcast or the daily newspaper. All the information is out there in this manner for people to find. The, the drama becomes what you choose to read and how much time you have to invest in learning all that. Uh, it's our job to kind of, there's no question that we have kind of, we, we play kind of a gatekeeper's role about deciding what's important. Um, on a good day, we balance it out correctly. On a bad day, uh, th there are posers who pretend to be journalists who don't necessarily tell the story the way it ought to be told in a straightforward way. But, but that's what our role is supposed to be. John Decker, you're both a professor and a practitioner. Um, what do you see the role of the press as in a, in a campaign? I think ultimately it's informing the public. Every four years, Americans have a very important decision to make, and that's who's going to be the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's the job of the press <coughs> to make people aware of who their choices are, where they stand, and although some candidates may not like it, what their values are, how they come to make those decisions that they will ultimately make for 275 million people. 
Senator, let me read you a quote from uh, Bill Bradley's uh, book called Time Present, Time Past. It was published in uh, 1996. He said, when the red-hot media burn is in progress, it seems that nothing escapes its flames. The reporters are waiting at each stop on your campaign schedule. Just to see them, let alone to hear them, shortens your breath, dries up your voice, turns your face hot, tightens your chest, and makes you feel like an average guy about to be hit by the heavyweight champion. Is that about to get it? Yeah, about right, yeah. I think I can add a few more. <laughs> Pretty well. I mean, getting off the press plane, as Mike knows probably better than others, but uh, you're never not quite certain you want to take that first step. Uh, and you got, you're always trying to prepare yourself, what may happen at this stop, what may... And of course, you're trying to stay on message, which is always difficult for me, because I like to visit with the press. But, uh, you know, somebody's got something out of left field they want you to respond on, and that may step on your story for the whole day, and, and so at the end of the day, you've got really nothing. But uh, the press has a tough job, too. I mean, I, I've had my ups and downs with the press, but particularly when I was in the Senate, we had a great relationship. We were accessible, we were available, we talked to everybody. Uh, it's a little different on a presidential plane. You get new people who've never covered a campaign. I think there maybe ought to be a little course for people who cover presidential campaigns. There ought to be some just, these are just, not rules, but things you might think about before you get on the plane. If I might just add that Bill Bradley said that, but he would have died this year if I had that kind of a burn more often. He would have loved to have people waiting at his every stop. Perhaps he'd still be in the race by now. I mean, there's a, the, the downside, which is that you have to answer all these questions. There's the worst side, which is no one's asking you anything. I think, I think one problem is the press sometimes forgets that it's not about them. It really is about the American people. It is about us. And it's about the American people <laughs> and the voters. And you know, candidates struggle sometimes to try to address issues that they know voters care about. I mean, we, we poll, we, we have a sense of what the issues are that the American people want to see addressed, and candidates try and try and try to, to address them. But it's so easy for the press corps sometimes to hijack the, the debate and carry it off in some tangential direction that may or may not have any real bearing on what the concerns of Americans Jack are. I think that's, that's a real problem. Jack Germain from the Washington, uh, from the Baltimore Sun said that, that we're covering a phenomenon that we create, um, meaning the press. I, I think that's often true, and I, th I think that you know, it's surprising to me because the press knows, you know, that they do as much research in a way as, as campaigns do, and they see their audience shares decline, they see their circulation figures decline, they say, oh, gee, I wonder why that's happening. It's because they're having a conversation about issues that only they care about. They're not thinking about the perspective of their audience and what their audience wants to hear about. And I think it would be fair for the press then to say, well, sometimes the candidates don't have anything interesting to say on those issues and that they would cover it if, you know, if the candidates did say something interesting. But I think there's a real disconnect between the way in which uh, the press corps collectively approaches covering a campaign uh, and what the American people really seem to want. Let, let me go back to something Senator Dole said, um, and that is that the press, the press that comes on a campaign is not the press that you see all the time uh, in Washington, uh, in, on, on the Hill or at the White House or the State Department. Um, the reporters who cover the State Department and the White House tend to be specialists in those, uh, in those issues, or Congress. And then you get uh, another group of reporters who come on the campaign who are not familiar with the players and not familiar with the issues. Do you, do, is there a, a qualitative difference? There is. In fact, there's a qualitative difference in between the State Department press corps that, that you know and the White House press corps. And John, you've seen them both. The State Department press corps is a much more substantive, policy-oriented beat, but they don't get very close to the campaigns. The White House press corps, kind of a more of a political beat, but they tend to be uh, there and covering the institution more often than not. They're not the ones that are on the campaign trail. I've, I've had a, an idea for a modest proposal, which is let's take some of those policy specialists in the press, a guy like uh, B Robert Pear at the New York Times, who you know, knows a lot about social policy, education, health care. We know education and health care, just for example, are two of the issues that the American voter cares most about. And put a guy like that out on the campaign trail, writing the lead story day in and day out. What were the candidates saying about the issue that that journalist has some expertise in? I think you'd get an entirely different kind of coverage uh, the people who cover campaigns now are technical experts in campaigns. They love polls, consultants. They love, you know, to kind of look at the dynamic, the theater of the 
campaign. They're not so much driven by but, a keen interest in the policy. But you're assuming for a minute that all campaign coverage is what happens with campaign reporters on a plane, and that's just not so. Robert Pear writes as many stories about this campaign in Washington, writing policy stories that, that, that dictate the future when, of this. And the last time I saw Robert Pear, he was on the, on the, no, on the no, road on no, a campaign. I, I agree. But that doesn't necessarily mean he was writing a better story about the events that happened I, that day because he was there. Well, I see, that's my let me point. Just, right? Let me just finish my thought because okay. I think there's a larger, there's a larger issue and it's, a, an issue where it's an issue that goes to the responsibility of the viewer and the reader. Um, if, if George W. Bush, as he did yesterday, announces a proposal on literacy in, in the American schools, the reporter is on the campaign are going to say this is what George W. Bush said and this is what it really means and this is the political context and this is what he's trying to inoculate himself. Just as Al Gore earlier this week announced a, about uh, his own campaign finance proposal. What then happens, especially in newspapers, and I, I agree with you, doesn't happen as much in television, is that the experts then weigh in and write about a, a reality check story. Is this something that could actually happen? Is this something that is good for people? Is this something that there is a support group for? And I think I mean, a, a, a support for in, the, um, in polling, polling that the campaigns do, polling that media organizations do. I, I just think you have to go sometimes farther than just the reporters on the plane to define what campaign coverage but, is. But that's kind of my point. The point is it's an almost an afterthought that the, the examination of what the candidates are actually saying about the issues and, and, you know, whether they're saying anything at all about the issues is sort of relegated back to the inside of the newspaper or done maybe in a two-minute special, you know, a week from now on television. And, and what I'm saying is, let's make that the driving focus of that drumbeat of coverage that goes on 24 hours a day. Let's really, you know, take that substantive piece and put it at the top of the news, put it on the front page, and then see what happens. And I, I just think you get a different quality coverage. We've already seen this in, in practice. Back in early January, John McCain up in New Hampshire was starting to catch fire, and the New York Times decided to put a story on the front page uh, above the fold about some letters that he had written to supporters uh, uh, at the FCC, and I'm sure Senator Dole can talk about this. Um, and the people writing that story, it seemed to me, were unfamiliar with how the Senate operated. These letters are quite common. That I used to work for a U.S. Senator 10 years ago. These letters go out all the time on behalf of both constituents and on behalf of people that have business before their committee. And yet the New York Times felt that for some reason this was a story. And then the Nightline followed up by having John McCain on for a full half hour asking him about this. And he said in the first 10 minutes over and over again to Ted Koppel, it's not a story. There's nothing here. Yeah, and I'm sure Senator Dole can well, talk about it. From a candidate standpoint, I'm here with all these experts, but I'm just a poor candidate. <laughs> what I'd like is somebody just to report what I said sometime without the analysis in the story. If they want to have a news analysis, the, you know, the next column or the back page or the middle page, let's not put it on the front page. Let's give the candidate a break. So today he made a speech and he outlined the following without going back and found out in 1936 you may have said something, you know, not quite the same you're saying in 19 or 2000. So maybe that's, maybe that's the candidate's bias, but uh, it, it's difficult. I mean, I think the press has a very difficult time. Some, some, you know, some, are, some people in the press are biased, just as candidates are biased, obviously. So it's, it's interesting, but I think the American people like to read, well, Bob Dole said today or Bill Clinton said today. You know, they're pretty, they're going to they're gonna make a judgment on whether they think it has any content or whether they ought to. I, I, I agree with Senator Dole a lot about this. I think the, the tendency in the press because of the, the acceleration of the news cycle, the fact that the news is on 24 hours a day, is to do, to do something that, Gwen, frankly, you've, you've said you do, is to put it in some context to sort of explain why this story is happening. And I think, you know, in the proverbial terms of the journalist, the who, what, when, where is giving way too much to the why. And so you get a lot of explanation of motive and what is the political rationale for a certain proposal. And I, and I think candidates, in fairness, ought to be able to sort of say, here's what I propose, and have a real opportunity to communicate with the voter about you know, what their ideas are about. And then you can strip away the plausibility or look at the political rationale you know, later. But, but so often what happens now is that to try to keep ahead of the curve because of the speed with which the news is moving, everyone goes into this analysis mode. Well, you, you, you take a look at the front page of a newspaper covering maybe the 1976 campaign and compare it to the 1996 campaign, it's stunning. And you know difference. what? We're not going back to 1976. We just have to realize.
realize that we're not going back to the Huntley Brinkley report. The New York Times is not going to. I happen to have worked at the New York Times at the network, so I can tell you about how these decisions made. The story you're talking about, we all know here in Washington, all we insiders know that these letters get written all the time. Most people don't. Most people don't know that's the way business gets done. Now, maybe the, the question that John McCain could and did answer is did I improperly use my power as a committee chairman? The New York Times wasn't able to close the, the loop on that, and, and he was able to knock it down. So does that mean the story shouldn't have been written? I would say it still should have been written, because most people don't know what business as usual is. The other part is you talk about the speed with which everything is happening. The fact is we can't go backward. We can't just say we'll, we're just going to well, pretend that you, there's nowhere else for you to get this information and just tell you what the candidate said. In fact, what, what some of them that were, what NBC did during the last campaign and certainly what the New York Times does, which is they would devote a section in their own work of just a candidate's stump speech. And they feel very strongly, this is what he said, this is how he said it. But in the context of the story, if President Clinton said today that he favors school vouchers, but two weeks ago or two years ago he didn't, I think that's part of the story that day. Well, I, mean, I, might, I guess my point is, is this, that there is a real hunger for factual information mm -hmm. uh, before you kind of get to this analysis. And I, I think the Internet is creating new opportunities to provide that kind of content. I think, you know, you're involved in an exercise that demonstrates, uh, PBS demonstrates that there's a hunger for content and richness uh, and deepness of uh, approach to That's issues. the strength of the show. I mean, people right. have an opportunity for four, before, five, six, seven minutes. You know, before you get to that headline service. And, and I, I just think that journalism has, has missed a great opportunity. There, there, there are people who really would gravitate to news sources that maybe aren't as fast or as quick as the others, but have more reliable, deeper, richer content to provide. I wish that were so. The acceleration, well, the acceleration, though, you talk about of the news cycle has also changed the way in which newspapers cover campaigns. You talk about 76 versus 2000. We're getting more analysis now in newspapers. They have to do something different than what they did 20 years ago. They have to find different ways to cover an issue. And this example that I throw out of John McCain is a different thing. I mean, it's different than what you saw on the broadcast or cable networks. You've got reporters out there on the campaign this year who are working for Internet publications. And, of course, with the Internet, they can publish immediately. They're, they publish all day long. And so, they, so you're always chasing, uh, chasing the news. How has the Internet... What kind of an audience do they have? How, how big is their audience? Well, Senator, not, not big yet because yeah, only, you know, you can say somewhat less than half of American households have got access to the Internet. There's a real concern about how available Internet technologies are in all communities. There are some that believe rural and economically disadvantaged uh, communities don't have enough access. But that's all changing quickly. Okay. And the, the elections of the future, I think, are really going to be dominated by Internet news sources. And my, my point is, I think there's going to be a market there for uh, content sites, news organizations, the journalists of the cyber age, whatever you call them, who really are about providing factual, solid information that people can go to and know that they're going to get the straight story before they get someone's bias, before they get someone's opinion, before they get analysis, they're going to get just the facts. And if you get an analysis immediately, then everybody picks it up. It's sort of fact journalism. If, you know, yeah. they wrote it, New York Times wrote it, it must be true. Well, that, right. that right. wouldn't be my rule, but that may be the rule some people follow. And then it's picked up all over the country. And then you have editorials following. And, uh, you know, I think in, in defense of any candidate, we're not obviously perfect, make a lot of mistakes. We say things we shouldn't say. We probably contradict ourselves from time to time. But the American people can probably sort that out without yeah. somebody going great detail. I, I, I'll, I'll make an, an admission against interest, too. I think if we had more sort of what I would, I guess I'm calling fact-based journalism, I think it would slowly change the role of people who are the spin doctors and the people who are sort of the manipulators of the right. storyline in politics. Because uh, increasingly people, I, I, in fact, I, I mean, I'll be interested in your guys' thoughts on this. I think the Mc McCain phenomenon, maybe even the Jesse F Ventura phenomenon, in part is about an American electorate really wanting some honest-to-God, straight talk, a new vernacular, a new vocabulary in politics. They don't want to hear, you know, they, they know when they're hearing political BS, and they're, they're tired of it. And I. You know, I'm guilty of it. I probably threw arrows your way, Senator. I apologize for that. But, but you know, we... <laughs> now not, not too high, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but what's one, one reporter said, you can just straight talk, express. Sometimes you, 
Better be careful. You get, you get what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the so maybe you can get too much straight talk. Though John McCain is a phenomenon. I think that's, right. you know, that's what happened to the Bradley campaign. It never, never had any traction. But uh, I don't know if the candidate's always going to be at odds with the media. I mean, President Clinton has had his share of problems, and and there's, are, are the media out to get the Clintons, or are they out to get whoever may be in the White House? Will it be Bush, Gore, or whatever? And I'm not certain. That's, uh, you know, I don't say that's unfair to either side but uh, there's a lot of tail wagging the dog that happens in conversations like this because we think about the internet we think well what kind of audience do they have yeah. but we start to think that way then we have to think about well what kind of audience does cable have mm -hmm. and you have to understand that a lot of these commercial networks are making their decisions about what to cover based on what the audience wants not based on presenting the stream the audience says politics click oh, they okay. turn the channel just like that yeah, they do and if you present it to them however in a way that's palatable, or that's anecdotal, in a way that affects their lives, or stories about things they care about, then perhaps you can disguise politics as like castor oil and let them know <laughs> that that's what it is, not really what you're feeding them. But and when it, is, it has never been, you know, the nature of the noble profession of journalism to say that we are that sensitive to the market. I mean, we, they, there is a, it's a... I'm, I'm being very honest for you. Well, I, I know, but there, but there this are... This is really are what's happening. Equally people in the profession of journalism and I detect who say we have got to do a better job of, you know, awakening the interest of the American people in it. That's why we debate things about civic journalism and some of these, you know, different trends in journalism to try to lift up the interests of the public and, and make it uh, more real for people. But I, I just, uh, my, now maybe I'm totally full of it, but I just think there's more hunger for that kind of coverage than sometimes today's journalists believe. That's so my point. You bring up the McCain phenomenon. I just think that the McCain phenomenon was also beyond the phenomena that he struck a chord with the American people, he also struck a chord with the press. Right. And there was some sort of bond between the press and McCain, and an unwritten rule, in essence, between the press and John McCain. And the rule was, be honest with us, be straight with us, and sort of wink, nod, we'll protect you. <laughs> I, but he I, also had a very compelling personal story. I mean, anybody he, who he read did. the book, Faith of Our Fathers, mm -hmm. or knew John McCain, I mean, I wore his POW bracelet when he was still a prisoner of war, you know, when I, I was in the Congress. So he had this story that, you know, didn't have to be a veteran, didn't have to know anything about anything. It just, uh, where he'd made this heroic sacrifice and suffering, people, it resonated. People well, were attracted to it. Well, um, those of us who know John McCain know that he, uh, <clears throat> his language is somewhat salty um, at times. And I never saw one story uh, about. Oh, he was. Um, he got it. He got it pretty good for calling Vietnamese gooks. I thought. Too. Well, he did. But I'm talking about. I'm talking about profanity and that sort of thing. And I never saw one story about. It. I had the feeling the press was uh, was protecting Senator McCain. Well, they were protecting him. And this goes back to what you were saying um, at the beginning, what Mike McCurr was talking about, and that is different people coming into the bus. And when he brought up the language of what was it with uh, the Falwell? language, you called them extremists. Uh, evil. evil. Uh, e uh, was it evil? Yeah. You called them evil. I was about Luke Skywalker, I think. At right, he was, talking, he was talking in the context of Star Wars. But the thing that got reported was because someone who had not been on the campaign bus, yeah. a New York Times reporter who had sort of filled in for somebody, he was the one that didn't realize that he's, his language gets sort of... Uh, um, salty and and it, it gets away from himself sometimes and it was he that that reported that story so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so I, that's I, an, I, excuse it, me that's an argument for people who are not always on the campaign bus to be there that's right <laughs> that's in, in my world that's an argument for not having nonstop access all the time <laughs> by the press. I mean, well here's a question here's a question sense. for all of you after the McCain phenomenon uh, of this year can any candidate do less than give that sort of access to easily uh, has has it changed? Has it changed the whole dynamic? Well, remember that the the winners did give less and were had much more tightly controlled operations. So that's maybe a moral of the story right there. But that there's going to be some limit. I mean, uh, how many stories can you have in one day? Well, uh, how fair is it to Canada right, oh, yeah. to have you know to have to be on all the time? But the reporter, the, break the, the, other side, the reporters I knew on the McCain bus would really wished he would stop after a while. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, their good. minds got numb. They they, they would sit there with run, they would have run out of questions to ask. But in the end, it's, did he win by doing that? No. I, I also think that you have to remember we're talking about electing the President of the United States. Right. And the, the comments that are made during the heat of the campaign uh, can live with you if you get elected. And I think President Clinton found that out, some of the things he said.
1992 led to real policy challenges that were difficult to execute when they moved into office. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you, you have to be a little wary of that, particularly as it looks more and more likely that you're going to be a nominee. Uh, and I, you know, the press doesn't like hearing that, but that, that's the reality. And if you're holding a nonstop press conference, uh, it's very difficult to stay on your message for that day. Your, your, your message right. tends uh, to get you don't have time to write the story. <laughs> they can't get out of the bus. Right. Well, the McCain phenomenon, such as it was, and there are people who debate it, would probably not have happened at all if he had not done this. Mm -hmm. He would have been out of the race a lot sooner, and he would have, it, for him, it worked because it kept him alive, it made him a viable candidate. He's still a player now going into the conventions in the fall, or at least for the next couple of weeks, who knows how long it'll last. So for him, it really worked. As far as getting elected, I'm not sure it would. But I think even before all the campaign, I mean, if you turn on the nightly, whatever the show it might have been, John McCain is probably going to be a guest. I, mean, this, I think he had a it's a pretty good plan, pretty good, and he was very active in Kosovo, for example, so every night he was on the news or the weekend shows, whatever, and it, it's sort of a natural thing to slip into the bus and right. invite all the people back. I mean, it wasn't just an abrupt change on That's his true. part, because mm -hmm. he's been very accessible as long as I know. That, that agreement, though, that pact unwritten rule that he made with the press, he broke it when he, he yeah. told reporters who asked him about phone calls that were made in Michigan did your campaign make these phone calls regarding Bob Jones University and he denied it and he sort of had a Clinton-esque answer sorry Mr. McCurry uh, <laughs> oh he's familiar with what that okay. means uh, and I've, I've heard that, those answers here. <laughs> and at that point the press said you know what he's not as special as we thought he was He's yeah, that not, maybe not the same as every average politician, but he's not that special person. You, you, John, you remember the John Glenn campaign in 1984. I do. Well. Said that real hunger to kind of go out and see an authentic American hero. And I think the audience is always, they, they should have been, Senator Glenn is a sweet man. Is, oh, I know. Go, well, sir, sir. But, but when he would give his speech, I think people would say, well, he's just like kind of the rest of these guys running for office. Right. And it was a, inevitably kind of some kind of letdown, I think. And maybe McCain suffered I a little bit of that I think surprised same. everybody that campaign ever yeah. got off the ground. Really took well, it's the same thing that I think would have afflicted Colin Powell if he ever decided that he was going to run. There was so much buzz about mm -hmm. him. But the minute he got up there on a platform and began to behave like a regular politician, whatever that means, I think he would have begun to drop. Let's oh, once, you, once you get the issue, I mean, even in, uh, in 95, you know, he was running fourth in polls right. in Iowa once they got the, you know, they feel about the death penalty, abortion, guns, they go down the Oops. list, and suddenly you think, well, this not, probably wasn't a good idea in the first place. <laughs> yeah. let's, talk, uh, let's talk about one of the central issues of the, uh, of the McCain, uh, George W. Bush campaign, and that was the prevalence of, of religion for a time. It's the first time since uh, the Kennedy campaign that I can remember but that religion has been an issue uh, in a campaign. Does that worry you? Does that portend uh, something for the future? I think it has been. An, I think religion has been an issue, but not in the same overt way. When you have Reverend Jesse Jackson as a candidate and Reverend Pat Robertson as a candidate in 1988, mm -hmm. in a different way, religion was a very big issue. They were the ones who were pulling people out. People who came to their rallies and who came to, to listen to them were people who came from big mega churches, from people who came from um, religious households. And they were, I remember going to Pat Robertson rally in 1988, which was the first campaign I covered, and, and Senator Dole, Iowa. you were you running yeah. there. Yeah. And um, at some point, I didn't know who this crowd was going to be. I mean, I'd read all the, the stories, I had, didn't know who they were going to be. And they turned out to be just like my next door neighbors. They were perfectly reasonable, church going people who were just hungry for someone to talk about their issues. And so that's always been there. What, what is different this time is that there was a flashpoint at Bob jo Jones about something that even reasonable, you know, religious thinking people disagree about, and that's about, you know, exclusion. And that's what Bob Jones seemed to be about, and that's what George W. Bush appeared to be embracing. And that got painted as you know, anti-Catholic or, you know, we over painted that as a religious issue when it was part, much more a tolerance issue almost. But, but you know, it's, because we don't have a lot of context, again, I, I, I hate to harp on this point, but the, the press does not give us a lot of context to examine what the candidates say substantively about issues like health care, education. There's some coverage, but it's not the kind of day-to-day -day platform that puts the debate in that domain of ideas, substance, programs, policies. So the default is to go into the personal characteristics of the candidates because the voters are trying to judge one way or another. So they start searching for the kinds of things that will help them distinguish 
the candidates and what kind of character someone has or what their religious faith is or what kind of family person they are, I think those then become relevant factors. Uh, you, you could argue that there's been too much of that coverage, and I certainly would make that argument, but, it, but it's, it's natural that you would actually look for that kind of criteria if you're not going to have a way of evaluating the candidates based on what you know, some of the issues are. Do the, does the press play along with this then by, uh, by covering these issues? Well, I, Should it? I think they do. I think they create some of these issues. I think they pry and poke and, you know, examine in, in great detail uh, some of the candidates. I'll, I'll never forget in the 1988 campaign, the New York Times sent a questionnaire asking each candidate, I was working for Governor Babbitt then, asking for their high school transcripts, you know, lists of people who they dated when they were in high school, uh, you know, all kinds of personal information that was just, it seemed ridiculous. And what'd you do? We, you know, politely stiffed them, but, <laughs> but then, you know, in a way, the, one way or another, the examination of who the candidates are and how they grew up and their backgrounds, it all becomes public domain. All right, let me, ask, let me ask you this question, then. I'll, I'll ask Senator Dole. Would, would you like to have a campaign without the press there? Well, I guess it depends on what day it is. But <laughs> <laughs> some days you think, yeah, it'd be great if I'm just going to go out there alone, just me and my dog, and, and, and have a lot of fun talking to people. No, I, I think you need the, obviously, you need the coverage, you need the press. I mean, you need, and, and I, I must say, I, you know, we're talking about the press and everybody was alike. I would say a very great, well, the great majority out there doing their job, reporting the news. And you have a great, great relationship. You know, they've got to be independent. They can't be in anybody, anyone's pocket. And even John McCain had this great relationship. And it, it pointed out, he, when the time came, you know, they understood that there were some things that weren't, didn't quite square with what really happened. So I, I would guess, uh, as Jefferson said once, you have to go to have them around. Would, how would a campaign be different if you, if you didn't have the press out there? Mike? Well, it would, it would be unimaginable in a way because that's the only, that's the conveyor belt by which you get your ideas and get your message and get your program mm -hmm. in front of people. Uh, now, it's a good question in a way because are we creating now through the Internet a way in which you could have a virtual campaign in which the candidates could be talking freely, directly with the voters, bypassing the press as a filter. Uh, we may be getting to that point. We're headed. We're, we are not there yet, obviously, but we may be headed to that point, and that might be a healthy thing. It still would, I think, create an opportunity for journalism to put this debate in some kind of context, and there would still be a press, and there, ha there would have to be a you, press. You, you, you mean have a campaign without the without the candidates having without to talk to the people through well, the press? How could well, we do you, that? Because you're talking to the people directly. That's right, yeah. directly. Now that that's an interesting idea. The technologies that we're, listen, yes. the, the technologies we are developing are are creating that opportunity. And you know what? It would then put a then you'd really see whether a candidate had the ability to inspire people, to get them interested in ideas, to kind of do all those things that we now leave up to the press to do. The press complains, oh gee, the audience is not interested in our you know, coverage of foreign policy. Well, if you can find a candidate running for president of the United States who can make America's role in the world interesting to people and get them excited about it, uh, that would be a very healthy thing, but I think. Is there a possibility, though, that if you did that, you would make politics an even more elite profession, in which only the people who had an intense interest in it would, would bother to take part, and the other people just simply wouldn't want to be bothered? Well, we're down about 50 percent now, so we're getting, I don't yeah. know it's a yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I think you, you look at, at voter turnout ratios, and you look at, at the number of people who, who are, the, the subscription for newspapers and people who watch the evening news, I just think you play into the, the least common denominator way of thinking by not forcing the issue almost on people, but not saying you're going, you know, you're going to take this whether you want it or not. It's just how you do it. I mean, a couple of things. Once you mentioned Jesse Ventura earlier, I mean, there's a guy who got elected without the press. Nobody thought he was going to win, not in Minnesota, not around the country. But, but one, one little factoid, though. In, in, in November 1998, I think na nationally the average turnout was 36 percent, and in Minnesota it was 62 yeah, percent. So he did something that kind of awakened interest by people who would he did been sitting it out. So you could argue that he did that without the press and without the conventional mainstream press. But I don't think he could have done it in a total vacuum. And of course, obviously, I argue the point that you know we serve a vital and important role and it would be the same so that's that's my point but I mean it's a continual challenge 
for all of us to figure out a different way, not only the press, but also candidates to figure out a different way to run a campaign. I mean, I, earlier this week, a perfect example is Al Gore decided he wanted to announce a campaign finance reform initiative. Now, you can argue all the reasons and the analysis about why he decided to do that politically, but he decided the way to do that, that he could give a speech and maybe it would get covered on page 80, A84, or he could do something that the Clinton White House mastered, which is release the story the day before to the New York Times, so it was on page one, and to the Washington Post and to the LA Times, mm -hmm. so that the big newspapers had that story all over page one, and only the second day did people think, you know, this is probably not going to happen, and it's not really much of a proposal, and politically, it'll go nowhere. But he, but he, he beat us at our own game by leaking the, make, making it feel exclusive for a day. I think the Internet's going to change a lot of things, but I don't think it's going to change the way that elections are covered. Uh, you know, here in Washington, you were talking about Super Tuesday coverage at CNN and how many analysts and pundits CNN had employed that night. And it was in the dozens. Gu guilty. Right. <laughs> <I was there. laughs> That's not going to go away. That's going to continue election cycle uh, beyond election cycle. Mm -hmm. And I think if you want an idea about what campaigns would look, at, look like without the press, take a look at C-SPAN sometime and see if you think that would give you a good idea, a clear idea about who it is that you may be electing um, for president. And I don't know if that's going to do it. Just watching George W. Bush shake hands or watching you, Al Gore shake you hands. You do have to have an intense interest to watch this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you learn a lot when you, I, I really frankly enjoy watching those campaign appearances where you see how a candidate moves through a crowd, you see you know, how they engage with people. You learn an awful lot with that kind of direct coverage, and, and I guess I'm, I'm still stuck in this utopian dream of yours, Nancy, but with no team. press. You also <laughs> learn if you're out there as a candidate not to say anything very loud because they get that <laughs> The press is trying to nail you saying <laughs> something <laughs> you didn't say in public to some private guy whispering. Yeah. So uh, it, it, there isn't any place safe anymore, I mean, uh, if you're the candidate. It, but, uh, it, uh, <laughs> it would certainly change things. It would have, if C-SPAN had covered Bill Clinton in 1992, it would have spent a, an hour or so watching him shake hands after an appearance because he would shake every single hand and, of every person there. And you would, you, people would have learned a lot about the intensity of his interest in yeah. winning right. and then also his uh, ability to engage with people. And, and that was, in, in large part, part of his success as a candidate in 1992. And I think you learned, I remember I was always the last person out, even running for Congress, everybody be gone but being the janitor, and I'd still be looking for one more soul. <laughs> but I think it does convey a, it there does. Is a message there for the voter. I mean, it's not wholesale, but it's retail. Right. But, uh, but you see, I remember what I like here. I, you know, we're, we're, we're dreaming a little bit because we're never going to cut the press out, and it's not going to happen. That's not my dream, soon. by the way. I just <laughs> want that on the record. <laughs> but but my, my point is, this would really put more of a responsibility and more uh, it would put more of the charge to really awakening the electorate on the candidates. They would have to have something interesting to say, or else they'd get zapped there out. There ought to be some way the press uh, could be energized to somehow encourage people to get out there and vote, give them some reason to vote. And I think sometimes some of the coverage turns people off. I mean, it's just all so negative, and nobody, you know, you end up a year ago, both uh, Bush and Gore were probably 90% mm -hmm. approval ready. Now they're dropping like, you know, I don't know how far, but after all the press and all the coverage, you know, how do we get the young people here today to go out and vote and take an interest in uh, what's happening? That, it, to me, that's the biggest challenge the media has. In preparation for this program, I found an interesting piece of research done by the Pew Research Center. They st in a study that they published in the fall of uh, 1999, they said only 6% of the people say the press is doing an excellent job in covering politics. Well, a near majority rated coverage as only uh, fair or poor, and the, the, the intent of this uh, piece was to say that people are turned off by things that they're not interested in and by things they think are done poorly. John, that Pew series, that research that they're doing on the content and the coverage has kind of continued, and their, their most recent numbers pick up on exactly what the senator just said, that the overwhelmingly negative tone of some of the right. coverage is really driving the audience away. And I, 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 it's, it's mystifying to me, just as a sheer matter of economics, why these news organizations that are part of large organizations that are profit-making enterprises drive deliberately their drive their customers away. It's, it's, the, the, that that uh, Pew study said that uh, the people are turned off by coverage of uh, 
personal behavior of candidates as well. And they don't want the press to cover them. They don't want to hear about it. Yeah, I, I think they pay attention to it. I mean, we, they love, I mean, Americans love gossip. We've always loved mm -hmm. gossip. But, you know, we like to know that gossip is gossip, and then we also like to know when it's real business. It's like you take a survey. Do you like negative ads? Oh, 99% no, 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 but do they, they make watch a difference? Them? Yeah, they yeah. do. And that's, yeah. and that's yeah. the other part of this, which is you have to understand that people are, are, are not paying attention, and when they do pay attention, when they're asked a question like this, it's not they're, not, they're never going to admit they're not paying attention. They're just going to say they don't like it, and that's why they don't pay attention. We also have this responsibility as reporters to kind of try to find a way around that. I mean, I, we, people get information from so many different places. It's my pet peeve. People think they heard about the stain on Monica's dress on the mainstream press. They heard about it from Jay Leno. The mainstream press thought it was being responsible and was withholding certain seamy information. But it all got out there anyhow, and didn't all get out there initially through what we consider to be the mainstream press. So what we have to do is account for the fact that people are hearing this information in lots of different places. And when you ask them about the media, they, they think what they heard on Oprah is the same thing as what they heard on Nightly News. <laughs> so make no distinction. There's a lot of truth in that Pew study. And the reason why there's a lot of truth is because of the things that not only pollsters focus on when they ask um, focus groups, and also um, analysts when they talk about candidates. Are people in America familiar with George W. Bush's health care plan? No. Are they familiar with the fact that he has a smirk? Yes. And where does that come from? That comes from focus groups, and that comes from pollsters, and that comes from analysts. And the same can be said for Al Gore. Are they familiar with his education plan? No. Are they familiar with the fact that Jay Leno says every night how boring he is. Yes, and analysts say every night how boring he is and that he's weak on the stump, he's wooden. They're familiar with all of that and that was all filtered through analysts in the way the presidential candidates are covered. Let, let's talk a little about that, uh, the, the question of charisma. Senator, you were out there on the campaign in 1996 uh, campaigning against uh, a man who was, who was <laughs> arguably one of the most charismatic uh, political figures we've some, seen come along in this century. Uh, was that, a, was that a factor in the campaign? Did it, did it weigh into your considerations? Uh, well, I think it did, obviously, but you know, I, I haven't tried to go back and replay the campaign, but th there are always a lot of factors. I mean, you, you, without trying to assess the whole campaign, but that, he was a good communicator. I think there was a difference in our ages that made different to some people. Uh, but uh, I think, again, I think it, Primarily, it was the issues. It was the economy. It was uh, a lot of a lot of those things. Plus, I think we had some Republicans around, particularly in the House, to frighten women away in droves. I mean, I thought looking back at my record in the Senate, it was pretty good. But we had some, uh, without naming names, some. Uh, and in every ad, I was well. I can name one name. I was. <laughs> I was going to do it for you. Every ad, every ad I was joined at the hip was a good old Newt, and his approval rating of that was 15 percent. Yeah. And uh, it was the, a, the candidate who ran was Dole yeah, Gingrich. Dole Gingrich. Yeah, that was my name. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, it was uh, a great experience. But it does make a difference. And I think this time, I think maybe Bush has a, a slight edge with Gore on the same basis. Uh, but we'll see what happens. So issues then did make a difference. I think they made a difference, uh, but I. Th uh, but you know, I, I don't. You get all these post post election surveys. We, and I don't know who did the survey, but we, we had an economic package that thought was pretty good. But according to the survey, 83 percent of the coverage of our economic package was negative. Now, how can anybody out in the viewing audience have a, a you know, an objective view of 83 percent? Network coverage of our campaign was 67 percent negative. Network coverage of the Clinton campaign was 66 percent positive. Now that's not fair. Now I don't, uh, I mean, maybe the numbers aren't right, but th these were the surveys we were given after the campaign. And, uh, that, and that's not, believe me, not because of any bias in the press in favor of Bill Clinton, because I would have, my life would have been a lot different <laughs> if that had been the case. But I think it was the, yeah. the way in which the issues played out and the way in which conventional wisdom set in early on. Now, you're right, tactically, I think uh, we made a choice very early on to take Senator Dole and define and his we were campaign. Broke too. Define his campaign in connection with Newt Gingrich and the Republicans and make it a referendum about that whole period. And how is that the press's fault? No, no, I'm just, I'm just, no. that's well, not no, the, this goes back not, to the earlier question about the coverage. It's not the press's fault. In fact, it's one of the fascinating things to me is the press did not cover 
at all or pick up at all on the fact that the Clinton campaign went on the air very early, very early. Uh, to kind of shape and frame the decision in that fashion. In fact, it was as stunning to me that it was not covered by the press. In fact, it was probably the most important political story of 1996 and for all of its interest in tactics. They missed it. I, I, I tell you, the, the other thing was that they, they did not get, give you much of a break. I remember uh, standing there with George Stephanopoulos watching the news coverage of the, the, the day you had the, the, the advanced man that I hope you fired didn't put that railing oh, on. Oh, Chico, out. California. And oh, you, but who remembers that? And, right. you, and you fell over it. And the networks used that take over, over and over again to the point where we said in our campaign, said, that is so unfair that they are doing that. And I, you know. Yeah. There was a lot of laziness, too. Um, in the media and in the press. You talk about PAC mentality. A lot of questions that you think may be simple questions don't get asked by the media. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Hillary Clinton is running for the U.S. Senate in New York State, as we all know. And she's running from a state in which she's never lived. She's never paid taxes. She recently got a library card there. Uh, I don't know if she has a blockbuster card. <laughs> no one is asking the question, why New York? Why New York? It's a simple question. And yet, the media, and I think it's predominantly the Washington media that has descended upon New York, feels that this is an, a race that ought to be won or lost on issues. And if you talk about a real issue, which is carpet bagging, then that whole race goes away, and there isn't a race there anymore. Oh, I think it's getting covered quite well. That question's being asked a lot in New York. It's a Senate race. It's a New York Senate race. We can tr tr choose to view it through how Washington newspapers cover it or Washington or national news organizations cover it. But basically, it's going to be decided by the way it's covered in New York. And I, and I do think the question is being asked. And I think a, there is a great shadow over her whole campaign that certainly Mayor Giuliani is perfectly equipped to make sure she stays there about what, her, what she's doing there and exactly what her ambitions are. It comes up every other day, it seems to me. Well, perhaps because I'm reading the Washington Post and I'm reading the New York Times and I'm not reading the New York Daily News or the New York Post or watching New York One, that I don't see that. But I go up to New York fairly often and I don't see that. I see uh, discussions about fundraising letters that Giuliani has sent out and whether they were fair or not. I see various things about um, people attached to Giuliani. Um, Okay, right well, here's, here's an idea. Here's a, campaign, but here, I don't see anything. But here's a practical question. Yeah. I'm the reporter covering Hillary Clinton. How many times a day do I ask her that question before her not answering it makes me stop asking it? I think it's important to ask her and get an answer beyond the reason I'm running for New York. Hold on, the, You're the reason, Hillary Clinton? The reason, She's going to give you the answer <laughs> she wants. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> the reason beyond her, her, the answer that she gave when she announced that she's running is, uh, my concerns are your concerns, and I may be new to the neighborhood, is in essence what she right. said, but I'm not new to your concerns. She's got to answer more than that to satisfy a lot of people. I'd like that, too. Yeah. But, uh, but I don't think that she's the kind of person who will give you the better answer. Let me ask you this question. You covered, you covered the Clinton campaign in 1992 as a reporter for the New York Times. You covered the campaign in 1996 as a reporter for NBC News. What was the difference in the amount of substance that you were able to do? Did you feel unfulfilled in 96? Night and day. No question about it. Right. You work for a newspaper like the New York Times, you have, I, my, it's the biggest difference between television and print. There's a page two. There's some place else to go to. Mm. Uh, the nightly news, you have your 22 minutes, and that's it. And if you're lucky, a minute and a half of that 22 minutes will be anything to do with politics. The rest of it will be, you know, lifeline and living better and living healthier and heart attack medicine. But it won't be, it won't be because that's what people will turn in to watch and that's what the numbers but show. But you now have the phenomenon of NBC also being in the internet and cable business right. through MSNBC and... Which and, has transformed yeah. the lives of the people covering the campaign. We talked about full-time internet reporters on the campaign. What's really interesting is how many reporters who work for newspapers now have to file hourly for their internet mm -hmm. versions. Um, it's, it's changed the, their rhythm too. They're scooping each other regularly on the internet instead of in their newspapers. The Wall Street Journal has a good story that won't hold till Monday. They'll put it on the, on the web on Friday. It's, it's a totally different world. Here's, here's another question about the campaign and, and coverage of it. It, it is, a, I think, a well-known phenomenon of campaigns that new stars in the press arise as a result of covering presidential campaigns. I can think of one who's right here, Gwen. I don't know what you're um, talking about. Uh, <laughs> Gwen, uh, Gwen became a national phenomenon through covering the, the Clinton campaign uh, in 1992. 
How does that figure into your thinking, Mike, and into, and into the coverage that you get? The fact that there are people out there who are hungry to be the new stars, the next stars of their newspaper or broadcast outfit. Well, well I, and in fairness to Gwen and to a lot of other journalists or journalists, and you still have to deal with them as the reporters that they are and give them the information that they want. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, in a way, you want the, you want the reporter to, to have kind of a full and deep understanding of what the campaign is about and what the candidate's trying to say. So you curry their favor. You know, you dole out little tidbits to them. You develop sometimes a cozy relationship with them, and then that uh, then does give them, in a way, a vested interest in the success of the campaign because they are going to rise in stardom. I, I don't, I don't think it's fair to any of the good journalists who you know end up covering the White House to say that that was a prime motivation. But it's it's there almost as a conflict of interest. It's kind of like why I still sort of believe it would be good if we had a diff different cast of characters covering the campaign from different perspectives and put them out on the campaign trail and see what kind of coverage they could generate so you don't develop this kind of uh, closeness that I think permeates some of the campaigns today. And in, in, in full disclosure, I should say that, that Mike McCurry and I have been friends for um, nearly 20 years now since, uh, since we both were on the, uh, the John Glenn campaign in, in 1984. Yeah. But there were times when, um, when I felt this gave me an access to you that perhaps other reporters didn't have. I think that's true, and it probably uh, you know, gave you insights that, that you could then share with your audience and you were reporting on. Right. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. I've always, I, I tried several times to create with President Clinton opportunities for the press to have more relaxed, informal account, you, you know, uh, occasions to visit with him. It's very, very difficult to do, though, uh, for the president. I think it's easier for candidates, probably easier for politicians at other levels. Yeah, we used to do it a lot in the Senate. It's very easy. Yeah. They appreciate it. You know, they're going to get a better shake or not. But you, if you build a wall around the press or put a fence up to... You can't come in here. And it should be said, your successor has not followed your example, and there's a lot of frustration <laughs> covering the Senate. Do you think that's? Uh, do you think that's? Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, uh, that closeness between reporters and press secretaries, or the people that they cover? I, it depends on how you define closeness. Yeah. I mean, I I don't hang out necessarily in my free time with the people I cover. I don't typically I. go to their houses, and and I don't. They don't come to mind. But on the other hand, there's no, we're human beings. There's no reason why we can't get along. And, and the getting along part is helped. One of the reasons why Mike was a successful White House press secretary is because people never had the sense that he was lying to them. Right. They had a sense that he was telling them the truth as far as he could and that when he couldn't, he stopped. And whether that was always true or not, that was the sense, that sense people took away from it. The only times I've had following outs with people I've covered over time is when I felt they weren't telling me the truth. I mean, it, it's an, I mean, this is an important point. It is an adversarial relationship, and I think it's good and healthy that it's adversarial, because the press ought to be skeptical. They ought to test out what candidates say. They ought to get reaction from opposing points of view to kind of shape a better understanding of truth. It is about seeking truth, as Gwen said, but there's no reason why it can't be a professional, even amicable relationship. Right. Yeah. People it, could have some respect for each other, and I think we've lost a lot of that. John, another point that needs to be brought out as it relates to campaigns, not so much covering the White House or covering the Senate, is that on campaign buses, and Gwen can talk about this, there may be among some reporters, sort of a Stockholm syndrome that develops in that <laughs> you're all um, hostage on the bus. Well, right? hostage. Well, beyond that, that the reporters who have been assigned a particular candidate, that's their candidate. They're going to be with that candidate for the duration of the campaign, and as it goes along, they may become more sympathetic to the candidate when or they're less. asked, or less sympathetic, yeah. perhaps. But their news goes beyond just reporting the news and it often becomes analysis. I think one, one thing that we've missed here, maybe we haven't missed it, but we've been talking about the media generally, but I'm looking at, let's say you're running for president, there's, you know, there's the regional media, there's the local media, right. and then there's the national media, the people on the plane. And uh, it's been my experience that if I live in Omaha, for example, I'm, I may have take, uh, uh, read more carefully what the World Herald says or what the TV station, local TV station says, and I made the nightly news. Mm -hmm. So we've got different types of media, different classes of media uh, that I think we probably haven't talked about. We've talked about sort of the big, you know, the Gwen Eiffels, and she's just done a great job at NBC and uh, New York Times, probably not my favorite publication. <laughs> I can't think of any other less favorite, but in any event, 
Even there, she did a great job. But what about the Russell Daily News or the Great Ben Tribune? You've mm -hmm. been to Great Ben, Kansas. Mm -hmm. I have. And Which only covers the election when the guy comes to town, and the rest of the time, they don't cover it at all. No. But I mean, it may I've, be good positive coverage. So, yeah. I've been on that. I've been uh, a reporter in Miami for NBC News, um, a local affiliate there, and I've covered President Clinton when he's come to town and stayed in Fisher Island and gone to the Bell Harbor Sheraton. And the coverage that you do as a local reporter is so different oh, than the nice. coverage that you do so nice. as a national reporter. And you can't get into a lot of detail, quite frankly, when you're a local reporter. Let me, uh, let me end it there and thank you all for uh, taking part. It is certainly one of the most enduring uh, controversies uh, of political life in this country the way the press covers the presidential elections and it will i'm sure continue to endure long after we are gone <laughs> <laughs> reporters and politicians will still be talking about it thank you senator thurman yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks john thank you he'll be around